Disco. Welcome back to 10th Century. Thanks for joining us the fifth time, I think this is. It's good to see you again. Thank you, Steve. Uh, it's really uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, and I would like to start off this podcast, uh, if you don't mind, with an apology. I, I, I feel a need to apologize to you and to some of your viewership for, for some of my comments about a particular Navy fighter that that was, uh, they were disingenuous and uh, maybe even demeaning and were offensive, uh, but in a uh, kidding sort of way. So I, I want to know that, I want you to know, and I want your viewership to know that I apologize for anyone that I may have, to anyone that I may have offended with my remarks. Uh, the uh, F-14 community has a huge following of uh, of enthusiasts, uh, Tomcat enthusiasts, uh, doing no uh, small part to the to the uh, very popular hit movie Top Gun. Uh, but I, I do want to explain myself a little bit in this apology, and that is that because I too am a Tomcat enthusiast, I even have a Tomcat T-shirt that I'll show you in a moment. Uh, but uh, Tomcat enthusiasts tend to want to believe or want to portray the F-14 as a third-generation supersonic air-to-air -air fighter. But it is not really, because the, the uh, attributes of a third-generation uh, supersonic air-to-air -air fighter is a, a sensor suite, radars primarily, that are able to, to uh, uh, that are pulse Doppler and are able to ferret out targets below the altitude of the of the fighter. The Tomcat didn't have that. It, this radar was, the AUG-9 was pulse or Doppler. There was not a pulse Doppler radar. The uh, third generation fighters have a fire control computer uh, that essentially replaced the backseater in both the F-4 and the F-14. Uh, the uh, third generation um, air to air fighters have a, a greater than one to one thrust to weight ratio. The Tomcat did not. It's a very heavy airplane. Its uh, engines, um, in fact, the, the the weight of the airplane was uh, was determined by the fact that that it used and employed the F-111 wing swing wing mechanism with that big cross member and heavy heavy uh, hydraulic uh, actuators and everything to uh, to affect its um, carrier landing capability. So uh, so it's not really. A third generation. It's better than an F4, so it's really a generation 2.5 rather than a 3.0. Consequently, uh, it doesn't really rate comparison, direct comparison, face to face, note to nose, beat to beat, uh, toe to toe, mano y mano, with the F15 Eagle. In fact, it's uh, as we know from its uh, very uh, checkered and sordid history that uh, it. It did not perform well in Desert Storm. Even, even the, the night raids of, on H2 and H3 the first night, it was the bomb-carrying Hornets that wound up getting the two air-to-air -air kills, <laughs> not the escorting Tomcats, right? That is truth in, in history books. And subsequently that, uh, to that, subsequent to that, <laughs> many of the Tomcat drivers I know, and I've flown with several in FedEx, they they refused to talk about what they did in Desert Storm because they basically said we did nothing. Our 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 airplanes were parked in the back of the hangar on the ship, and we just flew defensive cap. So then, of course, the Navy started replacing the uh, the Phoenix with bombs. It became the bomb cat, and then faded off into history. The F fifteen, as far as I know, is still operational. <laughs> Still going strong. I think it might even still be in production. So, so th therein becomes my uh, my view of the legacy of the uh, of the Tomcat. Now, that's not to say I'm not a Tomcat enthusiast. I am. I am. In fact, I wanted to show you in your viewership the fact that I have a Tomcat T-shirt, and you might ask given the fact that I don't have a lot of good things to say about the Tomcat, <laughs> why would I have a Tomcat t-shirt? It's because of what it says on the back. Allow me to show you.
<laughs> so yes, I'm a Tomcat enthusiast as well. Uh, you know, but I try to put everything in into its proper perspective with my enthusiasm. But I do apologize for offending anyone with my trite remarks or even this presentation. <laughs> Well, <laughs> and, I'm and, sure there, and, there, there, there will be nothing to do that. <laughs> well, thanks. Thank you, Disco. That's uh, heartfelt, sincere, and uh, no doubt we'll, we'll, we'll keep them all happy. <laughs> anyway, it's all in good fun. It's all okay. in good. <laughs> it is. It's it is. We enjoy and, the competition. And no doubt, no doubt. I mean, I interviewed Puck, who's an F-14 guy, and no doubt those guys would have a thing or two to say about the the F-15. So it's all, it is, it is sure. all in in the spirit of of um, it, of humor and good natured humor, Ruby. Good natured humor. So, all right. To anybody who has just turned this on, you will realize by inference that there has been uh, four other episodes. There have been four other episodes during which time Disco has slandered the Tomcat um, gratuitously. Um, actually, no, he hasn't. He's just shared his views and his experiences flying against the airplane, and fascinating they have been too. So, Disco, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, I wanted to say something to the audience just before I get started. So, I, I don't. Uh, I've stopped saying can you like and, and subscribe and share this, but can you like and subscribe and share this on on youtube if you're listening to this on the podcast please leave a review for the podcast tell others what you think about this content it helps us to grow the audience and uh, that's the name of the game i also wanted to do a quick shout out there's a guy called jim he flies airliners for an airline here in the uk he does pretty much all the indexing which is where he listens to all the interviews notes down the times when we discuss a different subject and then when you're watching at home the youtube video you can see the chapter headings and you can just jump ahead or go back to where you want to go and jim does all of that almost without exception every week and um, and so all this is going to turn out to be probably eight hours or ten hours with disco he would have done all of those um hours so to so jim um i'm sure you're not uh, listening while you're flying but uh you are spending time doing this so thanks very much mate i appreciate it very much um thank you right. jim plan for today disco um and he's also a huge tomcat fan as well and he's he's um so so he will no doubt have got a kick out of that uh that apology right at the beginning right today plan we're going to talk 2v2 we're going to talk 4v4 4vx and then we're going to hopefully get into to defeat the few which disco is is your book that you wrote with paul Craigmore a couple of years back uh it's your take on the battle of britain well you'll describe it to us anyway so let me stop talking right. and hand over to you then tell us a bit about 2v2 what, what do you want to say about that well uh you know we've done we've done a lot of talking about uh, flying the airplane individually uh as the pilot employing the systems we've done a lot of talking too um about employing the airplane as a member of a two ship and a member of the uh of the element if you will um, we talked uh, some about uh, going uh, 1v2, which is not advised, but also about 2v1, which uh, is, is the, uh, the fastest uh, path to a quick kill uh, in the air to air community. Uh, what we really haven't talked about yet is 2v2, because all nations uh, since, um, since the, at least the middle part of World War II have flown in, uh, in pairs or pairs of pairs, which would be a four ship, uh, because uh, we learned through um, through you know, some rather significant losses in major air campaigns that uh, we really needed, we being the air community, we really needed to have a shooter who could focus on getting in for the kill and making the kill, and a wingman to protect the shooter and himself by checking six. And, and that evolved um, to where it's more sophisticated now. Uh, but that also evolved to where it's, it, uh, it, uh, it, we wound up employing two two ships. Uh, for instance, the Luftwaffe, though they were, they were the, uh, breaking the breaking the, uh, the ground for us in, in this way. They would employ two shooters and two wingmen in a single element where the two shooters would trade off so that the one with the better shot had the lead to make the kill. Uh, and, they, and, and we have uh, embraced that and adopted that. That was the basis of our tactics uh, with P-51s going all the way to Berlin during World War II. It was the basis of our tactics in uh, MIG Alley 
over the Yalu in North Korea, uh, and in fact, even in over North Vietnam. So, uh, so the building block of the well, let me add, in Desert Storm, we we now I'm talking about the F-15 community in the, in the U.S. Air Force started off employing four ships. Uh, and after the first three days, when the Iraqi Air Force realized that they really could not uh, compete in a in a direct uh, air to air confrontation, uh, then they 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 went into hiding for a while. But when they came out, by then we were using separate two ships roving the kill zones, roving the battle area, uh, and that resulted in, in uh, the engagement between two F 15s and two Fox Fats. Uh, engagement between uh, two uh, F-15s and two fulcrums uh, and two F-15s and two floggers. So you can see how it breaks down where you start with a four ship and it will break down uh, in the course of an individual combat or in the course of a campaign uh, if you achieve air superiority into using two ships by themselves. So two ship then, of course, is the uh, the basic fundamental uh, element, and that's what we call it, to uh, establish an air to air superiority uh, and winning an air to air contest against as many as four, as far as the Eagle went, as many, as many as four adversaries. So the um, we flew, uh, as, as many of you know, we flew a tactical line abreast about a mile to a mile and a half, maybe two miles up the stretch, depending upon the atmospheric conditions. Um, the line abreast, there was no, uh, no one, neither airplane was out in front. Uh, and, uh, and that was to maximize, uh, both the radar look and the firepower. I mentioned in an earlier part of our, 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 uh, podcast about everything outside of 40 miles is just setting up for the intercept. So it's to get on the targets at the anticipated track, uh, and be, you know, 180 degrees out from that. And, and come down the track because the missiles work best uh, when you are on their track and they ha- they do not have to make any diverging maneuvering because that, that uses energy. So you want to get on their track by 40 miles. And then at 40 miles, we start executing the, t- the, the tactic. At 40 miles, the radar look uh, will be about 80 miles wide uh, at, at 40 miles. And so that means that, that you have two airplanes that are only a mile and a half apart, but they're looking at a piece of airspace as much as 80 miles wide. So, and they're looking, the, the wingman usually will look low and he will set the lowest uh, scan, the lowest uh, bar, the lowest sweep of his radar on the surface of the earth at 40 miles and look at everything above that until he, until he runs out of, of radar volume. The flight leader, if this, if we use the standard, uh, he will find the base of the cons, the contrail level, and he'll roll his radar up so that the top bar is sweeping through the contrails and beyond. So, and of course, he has to take a look every once in a while, see if there's not a, a bandit up there in the cons, which uh, you know, we we used to say that if you can get sight of a bandit, that's that's. That is the most important thing. I mean, that goes all the way back to World War One, and um, in, the, in the F-15 community, it was uh, that the uh, little motto was, "A uh, a peak is worth a thousand sweeps." You can sweep, 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 but if you look up and go, "Oh, there he is," then then you, most of your work is done as far as getting to the bandit. So so the leader will look from the cons down, and so there'll be an overlapping set of radar. Uh, a volume of radar and energy going out so that from, from the contrails down to the surface, 40 miles to each side of the, the center line of the nose of the airplane is the volume of airspace that's being looked at. The, uh, as we talked about before, the, the F-15 is very calm dependent until battling, a very calm dependent fighting machine. So whoever gets the hit first, calls it out, uh, and, uh, and so, sometimes uh, it'll be the, the target, the hit, the radar hit on the target will be low, and maybe the flight lead will, will roll his radar down and, and join the wingman looking low, especially at the 20 to 40 mile point, just to see how many of them are there. 
uh, if they're close aboard, they're close together, it'll be a single contact because the, the, uh, what we call the radar cell, the, the uh, closest of the two targets is one radar return. But you'll also go back up to, to what we call sanitize high and make sure there's not some trailers that are coming in to pounce on the eagles as they go down to get the, the low altitude target. <clears throat> so so at, uh, at 20 miles, then uh, then that's that's the time to start executing the, the uh, and these are generic numbers, uh, half of the range in the 20 miles, uh, then it's time to start executing the, uh, the tactic. If the, if the target has started drifted to one side or the other, then you're actually coming around the flank and not going right up, right up the middle. So you want to, again, get on the, uh, the uh, extended flight path of the target again so that the missile doesn't have to do so much work. And so, so we'll either offset both airplanes in the same direction and then turn back in around 12 to 10 miles, and we'll take whatever we have at that point. Uh, and in that period of time, now it's very the, it'll, the two targets will start to break out, and now is what we call the sorting. Uh, the leader will generally take the lead of the two targets if there's two, or the lead element of two elements if there's four. Uh, because the bad guys tend to fly around in what we call paired patrol of two airplanes close aboard, like they're coming down initial for pitch out and landing. Uh, and so, so the leader will take either the, the leading element or he'll take the, the, um, the leader if there's just two, uh, such as in uh, Clouseau's uh, engagement uh, in Desert Storm. And then the wingman has to sort to the other. If it's a side to side breakout, I might have mentioned this before, then, um, then the leader will take the one on his side and the, we even take the one on his side. Uh, if it's an altitude stack, uh, but but the range is uh, in, indiscernible, a range difference, then then the, the leader will take the high guy because that was his radar look, and the wing will take the low guy. Uh, and we always expect somebody to drag out of the fight because the standard Soviet uh, aero tactics was for some, one of one of the enemy airplanes or one one of the elements was to become the bait so that the other uh, airplanes or the other element could do the shooting once the, the Eagles, um, because they're all stupid, of course, would just fall into trail behind the, the ones that were dragging out. Uh, the nickname for that tactic was, you know, dragging back. Uh, so, so the sort is, is very important, but it, at uh, 10 to 12 miles, we need to have missiles in the air. And as soon as we get missiles in the air, then now is, if the targets continue coming in, then now is the time to, to defend against their missiles coming at us. And one way of doing that is to do what we call a crank, uh, where we turn up to 45 degrees to one side, or we may both turn opposite each other. Uh, you want to you do your crank to the best, the most advantageous direction for you. So depending upon who's got you locked up, you may crank actually into your own leader because if he's got you locked up, you want to slow down his missile, let the leader, your leader go on in and, and, and continue to prosecute his intercept. And, but typically it'll, it'll be both F-15s are cranking to the same side or going into what we call a pincer attack. Um, we don't, I'm personally not that much of a proponent of a pincer attack against multiple uh, targets. Uh, because they can always split two. Uh, and uh, in fact, if both of them go on one of, of yours, your formation members, then that 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 15 has become uh, neutralized. He is too busy defending himself to continue to prosecute his, uh, his attack. And then, of course, the other aspect of bringing the... Uh, the uh, uh, targets to the nose uh, at uh, 10 miles and getting missiles in the air is now you, now you should be able to, uh, to get a, a really good idea of uh, the attack geometry for the visual engagement and start positioning yourself up sun, you know, to the side, swinging the wing line, coming around the, the stern in a highly advantageous uh, position, hopefully on both of them. And it's always great if you, if you both crank to the same side, 
it's always great for both of you to be in that in that um, in that uh, final intercept, final phase of the intercept turn to to arrive behind their three nine line, and, and now it's it's really uh, it, it's re- the, the 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 issue is decided unless your missiles don't work or uh, you found yourself sandwiched between the, your targets and the next wave of, of enemy fighters or some other some other other thing. As far as prosecuting the attack on that two ship, then. And then, then the situation is well in hand once you're behind the enemy's uh, three nine line. And then we go into the visual, uh, in, the visually engaged uh, at you know phase of the intercept. And I'll get into that in a moment. But I'd like to pause to see if you have any follow up questions. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I was thinking, if we go right back to where you're searching the airspace, uh, one of the two fighters, uh, blue air fighters, picks up. Uh, some radar contacts, um, and then you start to get to the point where you're almost ready to do your sort. And you mentioned maneuvering to get on the intercept line to help the missiles get the ma- maximum kinematic range and, and um, energy right. state and all that kind of stuff. When you're a two-ship then and you're flying this wall formation and you do those turns, obviously you'd like to do a tactical in-place turn or something like that, which puts you still both facing the enemy um that wasn't that is not always possible presumably so what happens if you have to make a turn and your wingman ends up strung out behind you um i mean does that happen that, a lot what, what is the no. procedure right the procedure is usually almost always the wing will stack high so that if the if the leader has to make a turn of the formation away from the wingman he can dive down descend Increase his airspeed, and he'll wind up in a low position, but he'll still be lying abreast. Okay. In the same sense, if the if the turn is is into the wingman, then he may pull up a little bit more, and 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 ease back. You don't want to you you don't you do not want to lose too much energy in that sort of maneuvering, because mm. once you lose it, it's difficult to stay up with the flight lead. Who doesn't have any G on the airplane? He's in full grunt, max afterburner, and you're you know you're pushing the mark. You're doing 480 to 540, uh, and you're pushing the mark because you want to give the missiles as much momentum coming off the airplane as possible. So you don't want to if if they that the turn into the wing is actually the worst of the two for the wingman because he's got to be very delicate in his maneuvering to arrive at line of rest, but not dissipate a lot of his energy in doing so then the turn inbound to put him let's say 12 miles 12 to 10 miles then of course that's when he'll take a a deep diving slice and maybe even cross under to the other side the uh and and, and there's also you know tactical awareness as far as the sun's location the uh, wingman typically uh, all things remaining the same will stack high on the sun side of the formation. Hmm. So if you cross the, your leader and you were on the up sun side, then it's time to get down below the leader so the wing, so the leader's up sun. Hmm. So that, again, as you arrive at the merge, if the wingman, the low guy, is targeted, then they'll have more difficulty seeing the flight leader because he's up sun. So, so it's, it's very fluid, dynamic. Uh, and it, uh, it takes uh, some um, constant cognizance, if you will, of your energy state uh, and uh, uh, your how much energy can you expend maneuvering uh, so that you do arrive. You want to arrive at the merge line of rest if, if it's going to be a beak to beak, you know, uh, encounter. Uh, you want to arrive at the merge uh, line of rest, but doing a in place almost echelon turn if you're if you can swing past their th- their uh, three nine line and start coming in from the aft, more of the aft quarters so so the, the secret is being line of you cannot clear the six o'clock of the of the man or the woman flying next to you if you are you can do it very well if you're slung back but now nobody's looking at your six <laughs> right so but you have a lot of difficulty uh, maintaining that contract and that obligation as a wingman clearing the flight leader sticks if you're out in front of him. So that's why there's so much effort expended to stay line abreast in every phase of flight. For instance, 
uh, let's say that let's say that at 20 miles the leader calls for an offset left or offset north uh, to to start to getting around the, the bandits, uh, and that may be advantageous. Uh, it, you know, it on the sun side of the enemy formation and, and all that stuff, but you, you don't want to lull yourself into believing that the bandits aren't here yet, because if they've got some low altitude shooters coming in, especially if they come in from from the flanks, remember that that forty to eighty miles window that you look through. That was at forty miles. Hmm. And now, once once you get into where it's at twenty miles, you know it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller because of the angular um, sweep of the, of the radar. That means that there could be someone just to the right or left of a twenty mile wide frame that is now coming around uh, from the flank. And now, if you've offset to the wrong to the disadvantaged side, if you will, the wrong side, now they're coming in on your three or nine line. Hmm. And, and, and they're in the notch. If you, even if you even if they were out in front of you, they're perpendicular to your flight path, they're in the notch. So um so the radar won't see them. My my whole point is that you can you can never relax your vigilance. You can never relax your formation keeping uh in the event of tactical turns. Uh, left and right uh, uh, as you close to the visual uh, engagement arena. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, it does. Um, so, so another question then. The assumption I, I'm I'm guessing is that in this scenario, you have either a technical overmatch or a capability overmatch, or you are dominant in some way. How, how do things change? And I know you're talking, the ranges you've been talking about are just sort of, you know, as you said, generic. They're not the real ranges you you would be working to. But um, how would you deal then with an adversary who can outrange your medium missile shot? You know, if you let's say just for simplicity's sake, Sparrow, eleven, twelve miles, whatever. Let's say somebody can shoot at you at eighteen miles. What, what is your, you know, because if you're targeted, the idea then of both arri- arriving at the merge um, or you know at the sort, let's say at line abreast, it seems to be maybe. Um, a little um, optimistic. Is, is that the case? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, but you, you you never really know who you're going to face. But should there, there was no adversary with that kind of capability uh, in the 80s or 90s. The um, uh, Fortunately, uh, especially with the uh, development of the AMRAP, we were able to stay ahead of, of the range game, uh, if you will. Now, once it got into the 2000s, I was out of the Air Force. I don't, I don't have any knowledge about uh, how that uh, game is played now. But if you did have a long-ranged, uh, now, uh, an adversary with a long-range air-to-air missile, and um, for the purposes of the discussion, let's just say the Tomcat was that airplane, okay? Because I think the AIM-54 can, can reach out and touch someone at quite a distance. So this is how we would do that. If we face a, an adversary with an extended range or a missile, let's say we're, or even let's say we're we're using uh, 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 AIM sevens, and the bad guys have the Amra- Amramski, you know that they've got a missile developed that outranges our our missile. the The way to to extend the legs of our missile is to get very high, very fast. Uh, and, and and never even dream about entering a visual engagement uh, by being above the con level because the con trail level is in, I think, the tropal, sp- tropal pause or the bozo sphere or some high altitude thin air regime. So once you're above it, you, you don't uh, produce a con trail anymore. And the F-15 is good up to 45,000 feet. Uh, I've even seen 52,000 feet, not going very fast, but up there. Um, uh, that was not, um, that was not, uh, authorized, if you will, because about 45,000 feet, the air force reg said you had to wear a pressure suit like the SR-71 guys, but that doesn't mean it wasn't done. Not that I've ever done it, but I might know someone has. Uh, so, uh, so the, the way to extend our missile, whether it be an AMRAM or a Sparrow is to get up so high and so fast, make the fly where the air is so thin that you maximize its range. And then as soon as they are off the airplane, then go into the, the go into the defensive, as we call it, crank, crank to one side or the other. Uh, and, and now the radar is looking 
almost at gimbal limit. But now we're talking, you know, 50 degrees, let's say, plus or minus five. You, you turn any more or the target turns away from you, boom, it'll drop the lock because you, you reach the gimbal limit, right? So so you want to get a little bit of cushion. And and by and you know, all, all the math majors in your in your audience can can do the uh, the sine and cosine calculations to figure out what is what is the reduction in closing velocity if one of the one of the two airplanes let's say that going 600 knots turns almost 60 degrees to one side what what is the reduction in closing velocity how much longer does a missile have to fly um and i mean that in terms of time not distance how much longer can it fly uh, while you are not pointed at the adversary uh, or uh, meeting the adversary's missile in route. Mm -hmm. So so, so that's what we would do. We'd go higher and faster, and we would forget about descending into an air-to-air air fight because it's just the, 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 the elevation look is drastic. You know, as you get closer and closer, if the, if the targets that are shooting these long-range missiles are let's say medium out to 20,000 feet in the 20s and you're up at, in the 40s the the radar look angle is uh is it's uh disorientingly um drastic it's hard to keep track of where to look when everything is is downhill yeah. underneath you underneath your feet essentially anyway but but anyway so that's what we do we go higher faster shoot first crank as soon as the uh, the missile was on its own i'm talking amram now it had achieved its uh individual lock then turn away and stay fast Out, outrun their missiles if uh their missiles in the air what about then a, a, a let's say a peer adversary so you you talked to i think you said it was the did you say it was dragon dragon kill or dragon bag tactic where there would be two of them and, right. and one of them was going to be the decoy and the other would then come in and sort of rescue yeah, the, the, the decoys thing. drag and the uh the shooters the trailers back okay well, back what the about target. then a, a more sophisticated adversary and maybe this is something you will talk about when you discuss 4v4 but i'm thinking you know the, the f-16s have their um, famous or i guess infamous exploding can cantaloupe um maneuver where they know what ranges you're doing your stuff at and when they get to the range where you're just about to take your sort they'll all go in different directions to create a complex radar picture for you um how do you how do you deal with that kind of thing so even on a 2v2 basis let's say you know the two aircraft go into the beam you don't know if they've gone up or down or left or right um or maybe you do i mean you know what is the what's you know is there, is there sort of a sense of a panic because uh, I guess it's at a critical range. It's happening at a point where you're just about ready to take your shots, and now all of a sudden your yeah, essay's dumped. And, and we saw the Iraqi Foxbat drivers be very effective uh, using that tactic. The Flogger guys, not so much. Uh, the Fulcrum guys, uh, to a certain degree, but the but the Foxbat guys, they they were the pros in the Iraq in the Iraqi Air Force. Uh, and and they would do what what looked like almost a ladder. They would one would cross the nose of the other, the second one would go through, and as the first one would turn hot again, which means to point at the enemy, then it then the uh, initial trailer would turn across his nose, and mm -hmm. it was like a, it was like a, uh, I don't know uh, making a macrame, you know, in the old folks' home or whatever, uh, <laughs> uh, where. It's, it's, it's several links, you know, in terms of what it looks like from from what we call the God's eye view, looking down, uh, because every time the they, they, they fighter that's hot turns into the beam, it was easy to lose that lock. And they were masters at finding the beam, uh, the notch. They were masters at finding the perpendicular to the to the rare beam, the, the notch. Uh so so what do you do you you have to you have to break lock or the radar will do it for you back then you have to break lock and look in closer and closer ranges the only real advantage is the fact that when when uh, fighters are doing this and this is true of all nations and all human beings they're very reluctant to, to change altitude drastically so the target will probably still be about at the altitude it was when you lost the lock so you roll your radar up or down, 
to put the, the last known altitude of the adversary in the middle to give your radar as much time as possible to reacquire. Uh, if the look angle is, is steep, as I was talking about, that really complicates the problem. Uh, and and uh, by looking down that that drastically, it's easy for the back out to fly through that little window, the, the you know increasingly small window. Uh, if there's two out there and you think one's in the in near the notch and the other is hot, uh, then you always want to target the 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 hot one if you can find it. How do you find it? As soon as you lock it up, check the velocity, the closure rate. If it's a thousand or more. He's hot. Even mm. if he's the trailer, he's hot. Right? Yeah. And then and then you talk to your wingman and have him go for the guy who may be out in front, but he's but that's the last guy that, that the that the radar broke lock on. So he's probably near the beam. So again, uh, you know, the when we when we call sorted at um, somewhere between say 12 and 20 miles, and the final sort's taken. 10 to 12 miles and missiles missiles are in the air when we call sorted uh that that is can be a very temporary condition (laughs) given the given the band is maneuvering in the exploding cantaloupe uh so 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 it's it's up to the flight lead to recognize that we're no longer sorted either we're both locked onto the same target or neither one of us are, are locked to any of the targets and then, and then we restart the the search and and, and, uh, and lock process and and try to hasten our sort to to at least know we may not have our guy anymore, but we need to at least have a guy, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, we may be we may be the leader, but because of their maneuvering, now the next guy that we can actually grab because he the the uh, they broke our locks initially, uh, it may be the trailer. And as soon as the leader recognizes, I'm sorted trailer. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, so then it's incumbent upon the, the wingman to find the leader if he can. And if he can't, then now you know RWR our, our starts rolling into the equation. Am I being targeted? And if so, am I being targeted by the guy that I'm targeting, or is it the other guy? It, their other guy. Uh, so it's a very dynamic. Uh, it's like the Matrix gone bad, mm-hmm. if you if if you you know from the movie kind of standpoint. So uh, so so it, uh, it really compresses and, it, and it's very dynamic. But the best the best outcome is is you resort. You you may not have your guy, but you have a guy. Your your wingman, if he can find the other guy, great. If not, just Stay with lead and start checking six, because now uh, if, if if the two of you only have one of them, and the other guy is untargeted, now visual lookout by the by the uh, F fifteen that doesn't have a lock becomes paramount, because the only way you both or either one of you will survive the engagement is by a good sharp visual lookout and just giving up on the radar. And now we're talking what we call the short strokes. We're talking six miles, five miles, four miles, three miles. Uh, looking outside the formation, be, making sure that they're not swinging your wing line, that, that one untargeted bandit. Uh, the, uh, the, the, and, it, and if the wingman has, uh, ha, uh, has the, uh, the leader, for instance, then it's incumbent upon the, the flight lead to pass the tactical lead to the wingman. And that's another dynamic part of the two ship uh, prosecuting the intercept. In other words, it, it, it works great if you can follow the fighter weapon school prescribed plan for a successful engagement, which is in our textbooks, right? How many times do you think that happens? <laughs> <laughs> the fighter weapon school prescribed plan for a successful air to air engagement. You know, that's that's if everything works perfectly. And then and both the bandits, you know, turn into fireballs on the horizon. But but smart, wary bandits and, and the Iraqis were, uh, they can take those things away from you and force you into into a, t- a very tactical, almost a play calling uh, uh, arena where where you have to keep your responsibilities 
uh, have you remain aware of your responsibilities as the flight lead and even you, for instance, if the wingman had the, had the radar locked and and you're you're sorted, if you will, he has the the primary radar lock on the hot guy, and he's in range, and they have been declared bandits. Then it's Fox One, the, the bandit at uh, at uh, five thousand feet, you know, headed southeast. Fox One or you know Fox Three, Fox Three. Uh, getting two missiles in the air. <laughs> by uh, by the fact that he's put missiles in the air, he is automatically the tactical lead because right. the flight leader doesn't have missiles in the air. Yeah, he doesn't have to support that missile, right? So a lot of times there is a lead change. You know, two you have the lead on the left, uh, but that's that's again according to the uh, the playbook, and it is uh, not always that clean in in practice. So, uh, so it's, as you pointed out before, it's very calm dependent. It's, uh, everybody has to be craniums up, knowing what their role is at each moment and when that role changes mm-hmm. uh, based on the tactical situation for each of the two and then consider it together. Mm-hmm. C- can I ask then a bit of a nerdy question about the um, sort of the closing, the, the short strokes you said, those very short range miles where you're looking then for, let's say, something that went into the beam or, or a couple of people that went into the beam and see, see who's going to come out or whatever. Um, are you going, as the range gets shorter, do you increase the bar scan? So you no. go from a, you, do, no. so do you collapse it then? Do you go to a smaller bar no, scan? I, I, I don't change it. Okay. Now, some people do. Uh, as you get closer, uh, what you would do is increase the bar scan if, if you want a greater volume. Hmm. Uh, I'm of the... Because at least in the uh, ones that I flew, and you may, I'm sure you know better than I, in later versions, um, missile versions, we might could have increased the bar scan without reaching down and turning the knob, but I don't know that's true. It may be. In any in any event, I didn't learn that way. Um, so we would either use four bar or six bar scans, and I would just take what I had as long as I was very disciplined about bracketing the target's altitude i had faith that i could that i could snag him sometimes though um especially with look angles then i could i could get a hit but when i went to lock he had gone through that window and was now below my radar beam right Hmm. so if it did not lock up that told me one or two things he either turned immediately to the beam or he got through the window and is somewhere under my nose and that's when i went eyeballs out I got to find this guy and I give up on the radar. Uh, you know, part of the, uh, part of the turn in at 10 miles and getting missiles in the air is putting the TD box in the hut so you can find the bad guy. Right. And that's what I mean by, you know, turning hot, turning on his uh, extended uh, flight path vector. So, 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 so that's how you know that you have what we call pure pursuit. You, you put the, the target, the TD box, even if you can't see anything in it because it's an itty-bitty uh, MiG-21 uh, at 10 miles. You won't see it there. But as that gets closer, uh, as that target gets closer, then you'll start to you'll start to see it visually. Mm-hmm. And so there's this transition period between t- the 10 miles. And, and the reason we turn at 10 miles, and you've mentioned this before, is that we want to we want to give the, uh, the the enemy the minimum cross section area to pick us up visually, and that is nose on. That is the minimum visual area. So that's why we want to point directly at the target. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we also want, we also do that to to minimize the maneuvering that the missile has to do, and all and, and other assorted advantages. But but from that point on. It's a matter of um, you know, uh, if we know it's a bandit, then we put missiles in the air. If we don't know it's a bandit yet, we're waiting for sensors to tell us or AWACS to declare them bandit, or we VID, you know, flogger, bandit, bandit, flogger, box one. Um, you get that on get that on the tape, whether it's right or not. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so, so. What I'm trying to say is that from 10 miles on in, uh, and especially if I've if I've lost him and had tried to reacquire and it failed, that's that is my threshold for going eyeballs out 
And now I'm in the visual arena whether I want to be or not, because he can see me. Hmm. If he's no longer on my nose, if the TD box is not near the little W sign on the on the HUD, he can see me because I am now showing more side view plan plan form or whatever, and I don't see him. And that is a terrible situation to be in for a fighter pilot, where he, you know he can see you, but you you haven't found him yet. Anyway, so 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 rather than because you know we used to call the radar itself. You know, it has that uh, that rubber uh, what we call a boot on it to keep the sunlight from uh, uh, affecting the, the the brightness of the presentation. Uh, we used to call that the drool cup because guys would go heads down, craniums down into the drool cup. Isn't that a Monty Python thing? I think you mentioned that a couple of episodes ago. I hadn't heard that before, but yeah, 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 yeah. Guys would go head down, head craniums down into the drool cup. And they'd be they'd be turning all kinds of knobs on the radar control setting, <laughs> you know, trying to narrow it, make it bigger. And meanwhile, you know, you're 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 just gonna you're just gonna die all relaxed, drooling, <laughs> <laughs> because you haven't seen the bandit yet. You've seen a radar hit on him, but anyway. So so yeah, the part of the disciplining of fighter pods of FFTs anyway. And maybe even vipers as well, is to it when once once you get them on your nose, and even if they're starting to maneuver, and almost especially if they start to maneuver, you want to get your your cranium up and eyes out, looking out. So, like I said, a peep a, a peak is worth a thousand sweeps. If you can get eyes out, get your eyeballs on them, that that solves so many of the questions that are coming. Uh, the the target's you know location altitude heading is he diving is he climbing is he in a in a constant term is he puking out flares mm -hmm. uh, you know you, you answer so many questions instantly getting out of those up so that so to me as the target was getting closer especially as I was losing confidence in my radar lot or lo or lost entirely then I I, I tried to go outside the uh, outside the cockpit rather than deeper into the drool cup. Let me ask you a technical question, Disco, before then I let you carry on because I've got, I could just keep firing questions that you will never get past 2v2. But, um, no, no, so, 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 keep so going. In, in, the, in the beam then, or, or the, um, the adversary going to the beam, um, when we've talked over the last, you know, four, four episodes, you've talked predominantly about the pre MISSIP F15. And I know you flew the, the MISSIP F15 as well before you retired. Um, so so you maybe this changed over time but but was it i've heard i don't know who from that the apg 63 is a very difficult radar to beam effectively you've got to be very precise in your in your beam um that's what uh, i've been told too <laughs> so did you <laughs> did, did did you um would you typically go into an engagement then uh quite confident that if they tried to beam they would be unsuccessful what was the success rate for somebody trying to beam you with whichever radar tape the older ones you know before right. it, after miss it whatever you want to okay. talk about yeah i think i understand the uh i was never surprised that the radar would break lock with the target going into the beam it because uh especially if they're doing a very slow turn they will be their heading will be close enough to perpendicular to your flight path axis to for for the radar to to lose its confidence cuz sometimes you know in some versions of the radar it would have a memory and it would proje project the you know completion of the turn or whatever and it would look for it on the other side of the beam mm -hmm. right now a tail aspect um so, so, so it it, would, it could retain the lock, but that was a pseudo lock. Okay, uh, it, it, when it initially went into the beam, it wasn't a real lock. It was a computer generated facsimile of the target's location, and now the closure rate was determined by the F-15's closure on a location on the ground, if you will, a yeah. point yeah. that that our, that target airplane represented. Uh, I was never never surprised to lose a radar lock with an air, with an enemy airplane or an adversary or a training uh, adversary uh, going into the notch, going into the beam, uh, because especially at longer ranges. Now we're talking, let's say, outside ten, inside 
16, 18, where we do want to start, you know, getting our getting a hostile desk declaration out so that we can start shooting. Uh, because this this situation is is entirely it's all trigonometry. In other words, once the once the target airplane achieves the perpendicular to the eagle off his nose, if he continues to go straight on that heading, it, it, it will eventually devolve into a rear quarter aspect uh, return. And the radar is going to pick that right up. Hmm. Boom! Here he is, and he's and he's running away off to off to one side or the other. So to stay in the beam, then that required the adversary pilot to be constantly checking turn a little bit at a time, five to fifteen degrees, to try to stay perpendicular. Well, if you got if you have really good GCI, and typically in the places that we fought, the GCI has been very good. Uh, and our aggressors, GCI, replicate that very well for keeping the F5s in the notch during engagement, say, at red flag. Uh, so that, that's an art that uh, that can be perfected with practice. Of course, you know, um, practice is a, uh, is a, um, a uh, not, not win and lose, but it's a, uh, uh, what, what you call it when you make mistakes, but then you learn from them. Uh, anyway, it's, it's that sort of situation. And guess what? When the GCI controller makes a mistake, it's not he, it's not him that's soaking up the AIM-7 or AMRAM. You know, a trial, trial and error, a trial and error basis uh, is what's required uh, to perfect uh, that GCI controller's ability to keep his uh, responsibility, his airplane responsibility in in the notch uh, and and invisible. Uh, the other, but but the, the pilot flying that airplane is absolutely clueless except for listening to his GCI tell him where the eagles are. Hmm. Yeah, and a, a clock position and an altitude is typically about as good as and a range, of course, a range. Uh, those those three aspects uh, are what the GCI can do. So then in the if in the visual engagement, even if even if you as an F-15 pilot Track the target that's attempting to stay in the beam. If you even if you track him by in in, um, in the search using the search mode of the radar, such as we were talking about using you know going against the bears, just stay in search. He'll show up. Right. Uh, you could do the same thing against a low altitude target because if he hasn't perfected uh, the the ninety degrees the perpendicular flight path to to your nose, then then if he's a little bit to one side or the other, then he'll show up as a hit. Now, it may not be a strong enough hit for the radar to lock on because the radar requires a certain amount of return energy to acquire, right? But it'll be enough to show up on the scope. Mm. So you can track a guy who's, because he's not threatening you, he's not pointing at you, you can track a guy using the search mode until you can get a visual on him. And now you have, you have, uh, you know, 50% of the advantage because you're on the wing line uh, about to swing in behind him, and he's trying to look out the side of his canopy to pick you up, and his his weapons, his radar, and his missiles are pointing 90 degrees away from you. So mm -hmm. so really, you have two times 50 percent advantage uh, uh, if just by just by following him in search, if you can do that. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the the. the higher the altitude delta between you and your radar and hit and the target, the harder it is to do. So you need to be down lower nearby, I say nearby, near his altitude, uh, so that all of the return is angular and not looking down at, at the planet Earth. If that makes sense. So, so this is this is about clutter. So you'd end up with a lot of clutter, which would further weaken the the true return from right. Just or whatever, like we from and just like we saw in that uh, that video, you, I could I could tell, and I think you could too after we talked, that there would be several radar returns, but then the bright one would be the target. The others we call birds, and they may be terrain features, probably not, but maybe they may be Mercedes on the Autobahns, uh, you know, in, uh, in terms of uh, the um, the Doppler mode. So, but. But so anyway, if you once you've gotten used to you know flying and 
and looking at your radar, you typically can uh, de- determine which one of those is a target versus a bird. So, okay. Okay. Um, so the merge, then we've got to the merge. And, and now comes the visual part of the engagement. The yeehaw, this is going to be a lot of fun. Ride them, cowboy. Giddy up. <laughs> like a rodeo. But yeah, the the, uh, the visual part of the engagement is uh, is definitely the most exhilarating because it's applying your VFM skills, you know, what you've learned in, in AC in terms of working a two ship uh, against a specific target or against two targets. The constant uh, radio communication back and forth, which one of you is taking which one of the bandits uh, and, and, and yeah. yeah. Uh, the tactical situation on either on either bandit may require uh, switching to where because especially uh, angles don't matter so much like they did back in the back in the uh, Vietnam days uh, because of uh, of the angle limitations of the heat seekers especially but break X does mm-hmm. and every missile has a minimum range and so if you're if you're pursuing and, per- and prosecuting an attack against an aware bandit that's breaking hard into you, you may get break X before you can get a missile off. Then, then that shot is negated and you either have to go in for guns or uh, fall into a lag position uh, and, and just push him around, Scott. Or since there's two of you, maybe you can switch. Maybe you can go to the other bandit and your wingman can come to yours. And that, that, of course, is very confusing for the bandits because they're each looking at the top of their canopy at, at eagles that are bearing down on them with fangs through the floor and hair on fire. And suddenly, poof, he goes away because he's going to the other bandit. So, so you can, can, can keep the enemy confused and, and thereby have an advantage. Uh, and plus, the, the ranges have just changed. You've gone from like a, like a mile on the inside of the turn unable to get a get an uh, an aim seven in the air to maybe three miles and maybe if whether it doesn't even matter if it doesn't matter if it's front aspect you know you pull them to the nose go to srm get the get the tone uncaged the secret circle stays on them and shoot box two box two the bend in a, in a left hand turn at fifteen thousand feet so so you don't even need the radar to help you in a visual engagement i mean yeah it's it, it's great Especially you throw the super search circle out there, snag him uh, in SRM. You, you know, you, you uncage, got a tone, shoot. Uh, so you can eliminate both bandits within five seconds with, with a properly done switch. You see, I find that mind blowing. I find the idea. Uh, we, so we saw in the video where you talked us through what was happening. It was the VSD and the HUD tape. We saw how quickly it happens. And you've mentioned that seven, eight times in, in these conversations about how quickly these things happen. Um, and, you know, it's like you said, there's like a freight train coming down the, the VSD. There's, you know, you know, just I find it mind boggling that you could fly this engagement. Um, let's say you're the wingman. By this engagement, you've got your guy in the TD box. Okay, that's that's pretty straightforward. But also, you would have the presence of mind and the visual acuity required to also then be looking out and checking where your flight leads bandit is. Uh, I find that mind blowing. So, can you can you explain how you do that? Can you you know is that is that something I, that, where it's a very, it's a it's a it happens only for a few seconds you know there's only a few seconds where you can make the switch because you're you're expecting your wingman to be so focused on his bandit that once he's got once the both bandits are at three miles or something it's unrealistic then to say well he might also still be keeping a visual tally on mine how, how does it work well let me first uh, caveat it by saying if either one of you are going in for a gun's kill then yes. Man. It is total focus on the target and the pipper, putting them together and pulling the trigger. And so there is no way. Uh, I mean, the the guys who've done that and had flatly tell them various things, even to the point of coming off, uh, uh, so that because the flatly thought he had a better shot or something, like that, they don't hear it. They don't hear it. The stress is so high, the focus is so intense 
that there is no way of doing any kind of switching once you're going in for guns because it is total concentration on on get and getting that gun attack uh, uh, completed successfully. But up until one of you call going in for guns, uh, it's uh, what you're describing is entirely dependent uh, on basically mental processing of what you're hearing. For instance. Is this, as a wingman or leader, even when uh, when someone calls uh, uh, something such as uh, bandits are splitting, I've got the East Bandit, uh, and, and you look down, you got the West Bandit. Okay, fine, we're sorted. Uh, and then, but you know, if you're both com- coming up the middle and they're doing a, a pincer attack, that and this is how I used to do it. Once we got inside, say, six miles, that was just my own personal range. If, if my flight lead called, uh, you know, five, six miles, then he would always call position. Uh, usually, I say always. Usually he'd call position, um, you know, 20 right low or, or my nose high. Well, as soon as he said that, I would look at him. And he became a big, you know, compass in the sky. And then I would look off his nose, up or down, and then swing left or right to see if I could pick up his guy. The uh, and, and when I was talking about uh, looking down, like you, after you've lost the lock, and he's flown through the little window, the radar window. The the thing about uh, finding other airplanes in the sky is, is if if you're not pointed directly at them and they're pointed directly at you, there will be some movement. He'll be racing across the terrain, right? Or he'll be racing across the blue. And so it's real easy to pick up another airplane if they're moving. If they're stationary, uh, that's a bad thing because that means that uh, he is on a collision course with you. <laughs> that's not a good thing. <laughs> but but if my if my flight leader is to the right and he calls uh, my, my bandits, uh, you know, after you pull him to the nose and they split or whatever, or he lost his lock, he grabbed it again. Whatever the situation is, if he announces uh, 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 locked bandit 20 right low, then I go again, my eyes go to his airplane, off his nose, down low, to the outside of the formation, because that's because that'd be to the right side of him, and I'm on the left side of him. And the, and the same is, you know, the converse is true on the on the other side. So so uh, uh, when when uh, those words are spoken by one or the other, giving a, a position of that, that F-15's target, then it's incumbent upon the other member of the formation to, tr- to make an attempt to, to see him, find him. Uh, and, and usually at six miles, if, if the bandit, let's use that example again, if the bandit is 20 right, then my flight lead will already be belly up to me because he's going to try to swing that guy's wing line or at least uh, meet him in the front quarter uh, with minimum cr- uh, head and crossing angles. So, so that helps too. You know, he may be twenty degrees to the right on the guy, on the flight lead scope, but as he's bringing his nose around, his nose is going to be pointed at him. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so so that's the processing needed, and and that only comes uh, comes about through practice, just doing it again and again and again. How many, how in, many a thou- in a thousand hours of air to air practice, you'll probably have 3,000 engagements. Usually, yeah. we were able to get three engagements in for, for an hour in the, in the working area. So, so how many, uh, if, if you assume a first tour, you know, th- what would you get? 300 hours, um, you know, on a first, on a first tour in the Eagle? Yeah, usually years. 350. So, I think I got 350, 360, something like that, maybe 380 in the first year. Little less the second year, third year less less still, but always about three hundred. And, and would so you that's just, average three fifty. So that's that's a thousand hours in, in a three year tour. And at the end of the, at the end of the first year, you, I mean, how how long as an eagle driver do you have to practice for until that stuff starts happening? Because I guess the other thing is you, you're talking about okay, he's giving me a reference for the bandit based on his position you and you look across to, to see him you've got to know he's there you have to you know i guess if you're in this beautiful line of breast it's easy um but if it hasn't worked out and that's you your job to, there's okay and that's your job that's part of the contract the, the flight lead wingman contract the contract is 
is, uh, you know, if the wingman will be in line of rest with the flight lead until the tactical situation dictates that he split off on his own. Right. So that's part of the contract. That's why I was describing the maneuvering required to maintain that contract. Uh, uh, you know, and to, so that you can get into the visual arena in that line of breath situation and you can see, for instance, what, what if the flight lead said, lost lock 20 right low? That means that that, that target that he had, he no longer has. Uh, so look over there. There's the flight lead 20, uh, you know, uh, 20 degrees to the right, you know, extending uh, off to the right. Low, six miles or so. May, my my part of my contract now is to watch underneath my flight leads airplane and see if that guy is, is swinging up in a big Immelman kind of pursuit curve, hmm. and then tell him to break to get him to deny that threat. Uh, even he, I'll, you know, those words will be out of my mouth, even though I may not be going with him because I have to pros- prosecute my own attack. I'll leave him defensive d- defensive momentarily finish my attack if I can. But if not, if, if my flight leads in trouble, then I go with him. Hmm. But yeah, it, t- it, it, it takes a while to, uh, to get that, that you know, level of awareness, situation awareness, at, because it is, this dynamic is constantly changing. Uh, you, you prompted me to ask a question I was thinking about in between interviews with you, um, and I'd forgotten about, so thanks for the, for the prompt so 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 the the camouflage for the eagle then there have been as far as i can tell sort of three variations there was this air superiority blue in the very early days at loop maybe when you're going through the rtu then there was the ghost gray scheme and then there was the mod eagle scheme um which is what they still paint them in uh, these days um it's interesting to watch the almost you almost want to say experiments with camouf- camouflages that various air forces have gone through and it's interesting to see almost all of them have now ended up with gray for their yeah. tactical aircraft, um, so not, not not talking about training aircraft, but the tactical aircraft are grey, and, and a lot of them are very similar to the Eagle forty years ago. Um, what was as, as somebody who who presumably then flew all three different camouflage schemes, or, or not schemes because the schemes say that stayed the same, but the colours varied slightly right. um, over that period of time. Uh, we, how how easy was the Eagle to pick up um, visually? Did did you see a difference in the, your ability to detect the other eagles if you were flying against them based on those three different schemes was it all much the same it was pretty much the same uh the mod eagle was uh, perhaps a little easier to see of all things yeah mm-hmm. and within the tactical formation within the tactical formation uh fighting each other as adversaries uh, there, there was no noticeable difference so follow-on question then hornets um Probably other aircraft that I can't think of at the moment because I haven't. <laughs> I didn't think about the question carefully enough. Um, a, a false canopy on the underside of the aeroplane. <laughs> never, never seen it on an eagle. Tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, that was a Keith Ferris invention. Was it Keith? An artist okay. that, that okay. an artist that the Air Force paid big money to to come up with a a, a basically a, a Klingon cloaking device. Because <laughs> it was so freaking big, right? So the the whole idea of the uh, of that experiment was to uh, to try to uh, try to disguise it. But more more important than that, it was to try to throw off the uh, anticipation of getting shot at. But by that I mean. The segments of the camouflage pattern <clears throat> gave a false axis appearance. So if if you if if you were going to gun at one of those painted uh, F-15s, then you you might put the pipper uh, out in front of him and to the to, and to the side, allowing the, the twenty millimeters, the dumb little missiles, to miss. Right? Uh, that was a very short limb. Because the, uh, the the 422 in the fighter weapons school quickly realized that if there's a bad guy that close to where he can start shooting his guns at you, you've done a lot of things massively wrong to begin with. <laughs> so let's don't, let's don't do that. 
And Air Superiority Blue was, um, was the initial attempt to try to match the color uh, of, the, of the sky, say, above 25,000 feet. You know, it gets a little darker uh, up there. Uh, but, but actually, uh, that showed up uh, because of its um, – that because that, where that color is located on the, the, um, the IR spectrum, the visual spectrum, or visual part of the spectrum, and the human eye's acuity to that color – that's that's the other part of it, yeah. uh, and uh, then then that color actually showed up uh, more uh, readily than a a type of gray. Uh, even though the gray is, is you know it's not you know blue for the skies and the pretty girls' eyes and the bah, 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 bah. so it's not that, but but still a gray airplane hides in the sky better than a blue one. Yeah, yeah, but anyway. So, uh, so yeah, the, the canopy on the bottom, that also assumed that the bad guy was so close to you <laughs> that you couldn't, you couldn't tell uh, if, if he was turning towards you or away from you. And again, if a bad guy got that close to you, you had done a number of things wrong <laughs> to allow that. So the Hornet got it, uh, and maybe even the maybe even the Tomcat. I, I don't recall, mm. uh, but the, but the Hornet got it. But is it still there? You've you've flown in uh, Hornets. Yeah, uh, they still use it. The Canadians certainly still use it. I don't. Uh, yeah. It's a U.S. Navy Hornet for a while. I don't know if they put it on the Super Hornets. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So, but no, it it, it never had any. Um, you know, we just we you know, it, it yeah. Anybody that was going to be that close should be dead so 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 why I try to fool them? Okay. I don't Do know I'm, I'm being facetious of course it, it just it, it never amounted to anything for us yeah it was a cool it was it was a similar principle to the dazzle camouflage wasn't it the the, the ferris scheme it was called the keith ferris scheme wasn't it and it right. was a similar principle to the dazzle camouflage of world war one dreadnoughts and um right you know, battleships now, in world now, war two and now steve if i may i might add that as far as the F-15 went, and your you can't see it right now, but but uh, your background photo shows an F-15, you know, starting to peel off from from its flight lead, and you see those two great big rectangular gaping inlets, mm. right? If the if the F-15 is rolling belly up to you, well, paint, painting a canopy on the on the bottom of the nose. It's still having those two big, great <laughs> rectangular maws. Uh, that's, I don't think that's going to fool anybody. <laughs> so, you know, why waste the paint? So this I is... think what I'm trying to say is I think the physical configuration of the airplane kind of precluded that being an effective uh, illusion. So, so that, that's prompted another impromptu question then. Um, RCS. As as you were getting out of the air force in the two thousand, well, early, you know, two thousand was when you got out of the air force. The, the flanker was coming in. There was beginning to be technical overmatch. The you know Amramsky, you know, was right. was, a, was a sort of I think a, as far as I can tell, a, a, a sort of reasonable yeah. a, a alternative to Amram. Were you thinking about RCS? You know, those big intakes. There's no baffling in between the um, engine fan and and any radar energy coming in. I've been told the ECS vent behind the cockpit puts out enough heat that the Su twenty seven can see it on its erst at uh, ten miles or something like that. You know, it's it sticks out like a sore thumb. W- were you starting as a community to think about RCS? The the, the F sixteen as a as an example has a suite of things that can be done to it to lower its RCS. So there's paint that can be done to it. There's RAM coatings that can be added to it. Um, in fact, I think now all, all the Vipers in the US have something called Have Glass 2, which is a, a radar absorbent paint on all of them now. And even foreign air forces are getting it. Were you starting to think about that? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> Let's move on then. <laughs> and, and, well, and here's why. There is within the fighter pilot community, because uh, at least the F-15 community, because, uh, as you're well aware, you know the uh, the mecca of the fighter pilot is Las Vegas, Nellis Air Force Base. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the quintessential uh, 
Wild West. Yeah, uh, and, and F-15 pilots uh, and some others have been thought of as cowboys, right? Mm. And among cowboys, there's a saying that if that if if you go to a party, you got to dance with who you brung. <laughs> Meaning that there was nothing we could do about RCS. There was nothing we could do at all except for maybe turn away a little bit to keep their radars and their earths from looking up the, up the intakes. Mm -hmm. But the range that we would have to do that was also the range that we needed to minimize the visual, uh, you know, the, and, 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 <laughs> and this is a you know, fallacious term, but we needed to try to present a needle, a needle point <laughs> pointed at the adversary. In other words, the smallest, so so it's it, it, it's a, a trade off. Which which one, um, which, which one will hurt you more? Being picked up visually, or being picked up you know, by radar and earth. Uh, so so the idea in, in part of the in part of the maneuvering uh, outside ten miles from ten miles out to to thirty forty was what was adapted to try to keep the enemy from being able to look up the intakes. So there was some modification to the, to the, to the tactics for the intercept phase, okay, uh, to try to, but, but, it, but that, it, again, it depended upon knowing who your adversary was. If you knew you were going against flankers, then sure. Uh, you, you, want to, uh, you want to minimize their ability to find you uh, uh, certainly before the, you fight them. Uh, so, so, so there were some tactical means of um, masking ourselves, but only to a degree, you know, mm -hmm. that was, that was not a foolproof method by any means, mm -hmm. but, but bottom line was that, was that, you know, we, we basically had to live with it. Uh, if, if we knew that, uh, that their weapons suite included, uh, uh, weapons that outranged us, uh, then hopefully we would have uh, means of defeating those missiles in the air yeah. rather than their launching platform. So, your, so your, your balance is to play to your strengths and right. you know, a little bit of mitigation against your weaknesses, but, but otherwise you're going to do your thing. Right. Okay. Yep. Because you got to dance with who you're wrong. Yeah. So, I love that. You know, you get her a push-up bra and a fancy skirt, and take her to the dance. <laughs> tell, tell us about 4v4 then. What what, uh, what are the things that we should know about them? Well, the 4v4 by, by definition is an extension of the 2v2 as far as our tactics go. Uh, we talked at, at length about the, uh, the, the intercept phase from, let's say, 40 miles where we're, we're taking our first look to the uh, to, into the, the visual arena inside ten miles uh, as as a two show. We talked about uh, you know the radar sort uh, the radar search parameters or discipline the radar sorting uh, discipline and then uh, the engaged tactics uh, as a uh, as a two ship against uh, two adversaries instead of just one. The four v four is. Uh, it, it, is really the the quintessential F-15 go to war formation. Um, it's uh, it's four F-15s line abreast with the two flight leaders, number one and number three, on the inside, and the two wingmen on the flanks. Uh, again, taking the stack as we've talked about, each element is both on its own, uh, but at the same time, no, uh, it's working in concert. The uh, the sort uh, the search criteria remains the same for the four ship, and in, oh by the way, the four ship uh, when it is in that line of breast formation, uh, the two flight leaders are about more like two to three miles apart instead of a mile and a half like the wingmen are, giving giving the two two ships some maneuvering room, uh, you know, between the two leaders so that there's no. Uh, no uh, conflict as far as uh, potential midair collision conflict. So, so it's a little bit spread out, but from from wingman to wingman, uh, that at the most would be six miles, with uh, about uh, three miles in, in between the two leaders 
on average, let's say. Uh, the, um, obviously, the 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 uh, this formation is well suited for offensive counter air uh, ingresses. And it's compact enough to where, as far as Sam targeting, um, it, you're not all spread out. Uh, uh, so you, you're punching through the, the sand belt uh, in a fairly compact formation. Uh, but by the same token, you're, you're wide enough to, uh, to where uh, uh, the, the enemy has to, has to target each airplane individually, cannot target the formation as a whole. So, uh, so it's, it's particularly well suited for an ingress. For defensive uh, missions, Typically, we'll take a four ship and put them on a, on a, a combat air patrol racetrack or cap uh, with, uh, with the two elements being 180 degrees out. So that as one element turns hot to point at the threat, point down the threat axis, the other element turns cold and, and runs to the back of the race racetrack. And that way you always have Two radars looking downrange, uh, looking for the threat at all. I won't say at all times because obviously you're not looking while you're in the turns, 180 degree turns. But the turns only last a minute, minute and a half. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, that's that's there's a small amount of dead space. But the the point is that for defensive use of, of four ship, we would uh, we would employ as two separate two ships. Whoever on the hot leg will get the contact. Then they they were the ones that would be sent, even if there was number three and four, they would be the ones sent downrange to uh, to execute the intercept. And then if and only if the, uh, the the targets were there were multiple targets, let's say there were multiple targets, <clears throat> then uh, then the the cold two ship would be would turn hot to turn into a line of breast wall of eagles formation and process and proceed uh, to the intercept as, as a, a wall of eagles so so just because we split out the split into the racetrack is for the radar look to make an almost continuous radar look uh, but depending upon the size of the uh, approaching formation it, we we had the ability to uh, <clears throat> to form up in a line of breast and even if even if the contacts were made at the end of the racetrack, <clears throat> then then uh, that two ship would would press on out of the of the the cap pattern, and the the cold two ship would turn and turn uh, one eighty and follow the trail, and it may take three sixty by the leading two ship to get to affect the the uh, rendezvous to to form a line of rest. Remember in in, de in defensive. Uh, um, campaigns, defensive uh, setups, <clears throat> we should have the advantage of GCI. We certainly will have the advantage of AWACS. So we'll know how big the package is. Do we need do we need all four eagles up front or do we can we take them on two and then two to follow up? So so those tactical decisions are made uh, at the time based on the nature of the of the threat. But anyways, that pretty that pretty much is how we would handle a uh, a uh, defensive setup. Uh, once the once the eagles are in line of breast formation, all four of us a wall of eagles. Then they're, they're really from that point on is no difference whether we're on our side of the of the fence or or their side of the fence. We're we're going to our our objective is not geographical; it's the enemy targets. So so uh, typically we would, the, for instance, Desert Storm. <clears throat> the ingress would be. Two four ships of the eagles. We're talking like the first night, you know, first couple of days, uh, against the, the full up enemy IADS integrated air defense system. <coughs> Pardon me. The two four ships would be line abreast with maybe uh, eight ten mile spacing, operating independently but together, in the sense of uh, presenting the enemy with a with a, a large. Uh, uh, approaching uh, adversary between us would typically be the wild weasels and their job of course is to suppress the sams keep the sams from bothering the eagles and to clear the path uh, for the strike package that follows the um, the the uh, job of the of the ingressing f-15s 
is to eliminate the earlier threat to the strike package. So the, usually the, the enemy air will be found in the vicinity of the target or of a target. Uh, may not be the target for the package, but it'll be a, you know, it'll be a, a location that's very important to the enemy. Mm-hmm. But that's what they will try to protect, right? So they'll put a two ship or more over over that. Or if they're into uh, in, into trying to do tactical air battles, then then they won't be capping. They'll be coming in their own way, uh, full force, you know, against the ingressing eagles. <clears throat> so so that's that we'll talk about more when we get to campaign planning and, and that and execution but the uh but what uh it uh, devolves to is that once we're through the the uh the sand belt and typically the bad guys don't mix fighters and sams at least they don't mix them very well uh or they haven't historically they have not done that like yeah you know, this is all pre-2000 information so so historically they they were reluctant to mix their fighters in among their sams uh, for fear of having their own fighters shot down by the sams uh, and that happened occasionally um so so let's just take one of those two four ships uh <coughs> when the when the targets were were found by uh by awax because their look is deeper than uh than ours uh then, then it would be sorted out uh, basically on which side of the ground, the anticipated ground check of the strike package were the defenders. If the defenders are on the right side, then the right hand F4, uh, F-15 warship would take them. If they were on the left side, then the left hand. And the weasels, of course, are going straight to the straight to the target suppressing sounds along the way. So what you really have then is a force ship that is looking uh, maybe, a, I mean, we never would just sanitize the, the airspace uh, only to one side of the anticipate track. Obviously, we would have overlap. <clears throat> that way, uh, a, a, a bad guy formation could not transition across the anticipated uh, or the planned track from one four ships area of responsibility to the others without both sides, both uh, four ships knowing. So, so initially on the ingress, the two four ship commanders will be talking with one another and AWACS. And that's, that, that really is the only conversation going on. Mm-hmm. AWACS. Yeah. Uh, tiger, tiger lead and gorilla lead. Let's, you know, let's say we got the 53rd tigers out there and the 58th gorillas out there. And we got, we got, uh, uh, Cyclops, the uh, the the AWAX out there, <clears throat> the the one eyed monster. Uh, so uh, so we got Cyclops, uh, Tiger Zero One, uh, Gorilla Zero One. And let's and the adversaries are on the Tiger Zero One side of side of the of the anticipated track, and so they are paired. In other words, the, uh, you know Tiger Zero One. So those are your bandits, and from that point on. Uh, once the once the the Tiger four ship get, starts getting the the radar contacts, then they typically will take over the intercept. Uh, defensively, you have to call Judy to tell GCI to to shut up. I'm busy now because I'm I'm going to shoot these guys. I'm going to kill these guys. But but offensively, you know, uh, AWACS is there to provide general overall situation awareness and and detailed defensive situation awareness. When the fight swirls into a fur ball and, pe- and people come spitting out, uh, so AWAX is worth their weight, and it's it's heavy. It's a heavy airplane. They're worth their weight in gold uh, as far as keeping us keeping us alive after surviving the merge. <clears throat> the The initial tactic for a four ship on you know now that we we're paired against that set of bandits, whatever they may be, <clears throat> the uh, the the initial search is the number one element will be just as I, I mentioned earlier in the 2v2 uh, or the opposite depending upon the leader the leader wants to wants to find uh, <laughs> uh, the leader wants to find uh, his target right because this is his chance to get a kill right right so uh, so 
So there's this there's this uh, mentality or this uh, psychology known as got mine, find your own. <laughs> <laughs> that sometimes creeps in, and, and that will undermine the sorting discipline. But my, but my point is that if the if the banners are capping low, because they only have let's say look, <coughs> pardon me, yeah, whiskey will whiskey will cure that. <laughs> so if the if if the banners are expected to be capping low, then the then the overall flight leader will probably set the radar coverage for him to look low, so that he can find them right. Hmm. And then his wingman, number two, Tiger Zero Two, will look high. But then we alternate that with the other four, with the other two ship. Tiger Zero Three will look high, and Tiger Zero Four will look low. So, so that way we have dual coverage on the same frame of, of airspace at, at let's say forty miles <clears throat> with Tiger Lead. Uh, hopefully getting the first contact, especially if they're low. Obviously, if Tiger 3 has contacts high, then then uh, then that's where the bad guys are, and they're not capping low tonight. Uh, so Tiger lead now has will be given the lead. Right, it, and it, sometimes it'll be as simple as Roger, your your bandits. In other words, take you know lead is saying number one, Tiger wants to say, take me to them. You, you have the overall tactical lead of the four ship. And so now, and that's why every number three has to be a trained and qualified four ship flight lead. Because in this transition, they can't be just number three leading a second element. They've got to be a full up, uh, you know, ready, ready to go to war, take my four ship. Uh, I may only be given it, you know, as a pass, uh, but but I'll, I'll take I'll take us to the fight. Uh, typically, if uh, we outnumber the adversaries, if there's only let's say that the bad guys are only capping with two airplanes, and at night they tend to have fewer airplanes airborne, again to avoid fratricide, uh, either shooting themselves down or uh, mid-air collision. <clears throat> so so if we outnumber the adversaries, then a pincer tactic by the two elements is preferred because once you split split off about 30 degrees let's say at you know 30 miles once once uh all four hopefully all four uh have acquired the targets uh and for situation awareness uh, but the two wingmen well let me put it this way the wingman whose airspace coverage includes where the bandits are then he then he or she will pro- will block into that into that group. The, then that means that the other wingman who's looking at the other airspace is responsible for sanitizing. He may see nothing all day until you arrive at the merge, but mm-hmm. his job or her job is to make sure there's nobody down there, no. because the other three radars are glommed on to the targets that we do know about. In this case, in this example, hot. So. So we'll we'll drive in, uh, and we'll call either for a pincer, or we'll offset left, offset right, you know, to whichever side has the tactical advantage. At night, uh, as it was in Desert Storm, that tactical advantage was was driven more by the geometry of the intercept than, of course, by the sun because it's not there. Uh, so we'll offset uh, to, we'll offset to the cold side of the bandit. The uh, cold side of the, the bandit is taking uh, its extended target track uh for instance uh you know you saw on that that, that tape that several episodes ago where there was a, a 1l or a 2h uh i mean 2r so that's 10 degrees left or, or 20 degrees right is uh the targets where where we are to the target you see is the uh the the azimuth so so if if we are to the left of the target's nose then we want to offset left to increase that we want to get further and further away from his radar. And we yeah. want all four of us to get that way, right? But if we're real close, if we're within 10 degrees of the nose, then a, a pincer attack where, where the two two ships go uh, about 30 degrees off uh, the center line. And that way, no matter which way the, the defending adversaries point, then someone's going to have an advantage to turn in uh, and come in from the flank 
uh, while the others, the other element can turn hot and put missiles in the air off their nose. Mm-hmm. So now, so now it, you, you have them what we call sandwiched. Uh, and they're really, <laughs> there's really very little chance of getting away from that right. uh, by just about in, except for maybe a Fox fat. There's mm-hmm. very little chance of getting away from a, from an F-15 pincer attack where you have uh, three radars locked on to less than four uh, enemy airplanes. Hmm. So, so anyway, the, the whole point is that if, uh, if we're, if we outnumber them, which we would hope to do, then, then we'll do a pincer. Uh, if, if there's more of them than there are of us, then we probably would, would offset to, to the cold side, uh, trying to, trying to develop a, an advantage for all four F-15s. Hmm. And that may mean, for instance, that, that the the second element, Tiger three and four, they may actually have to cross the lead element. Let the lead element push push deeper. That it because if you're if the lead calls offset right in five, then then the uh, the second element is going to off going to start the offset immediately, and then the lead element will will follow. And now the lead element is on the inside of the turn for the. The con- what we call the conversion turn, the, the, the final intercept turn, Doesn't and now you've got four eagles on the same side of the bad guy formation, and if it's a um, if it's a, a host of them, in other words, uh, a, a string of strikers coming you know, across the fence, or uh, in this example, there's a strong example. You have let's say four floggers that are that are trying to uh, trying to, to to bait the F-15s and into uh, uh, becoming targets for fulcrums that follow. So, but the, but all the eagles are on the same side of the bad guy formation. Uh, in the, and if the if the bad guys, the floggers in this case, continue on, <clears throat> then uh, then uh, their their fate is pretty much sealed. And we had an example of that during Desert Storm. Uh, Rico Rodriguez was one of the uh, the great pilots in that in that uh, that air campaign. And, uh, and and he and several others that you can name off the top of your head, I'm sure, uh, basically wiped out an entire four ship of floggers uh, who were uh, who were running fast at low altitude because it was a well executed what we call a single side offset tactical attack. Uh, so 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 that's how we would would orchestrate a uh, a, a four ship on the intercept phase to get missiles in the in the air, as we talked about. Uh, earlier, the typical bad guy counter tactic is the bag and drag. There's several problems with that, of course, against an F-15 four ship. And the first problem is that after the after the two of the the bad guys take spacing on the the on the the bait, if you will, the decoys, now they only have two shooters. It's not a four v four anymore. It, it's it's a four v two. Especially unless, of course, we the, the flight lead just says says uh, hold that contact, which means basically hold you know, keep radar contact on the draggers, and and p- basically push them out of the fight. Make sure their RWR is just screaming in their headsets that they're being targeted by F-15s, and they're going to hunker down and run for their lives because all the the, the eagles are behind them, and that. And they're not going to turn around till GCI tells them to to do so. So they're running out, and maybe uh, the force ship finally puts the second element on them. But the second element doesn't have to uh, chase them; they just have to maintain the radar contact to keep the RWRs, the Serena, as they were called, the Serena screaming to make the bad guys think they're being chased. Hmm. Right? Even I mean, they are in a sense, but but not completely because the other Number three is Wingman, zero four. He he's been searching low, sanitizing low. There's nobody down there, nobody down there. So at a certain range, he's permitted to start to lock into the group that is actually the threat. So the the trailing two ship of the of the, the bad guys, fulcrums, um, or foggers or what what have you, <clears throat> or fox bass. When that all three of those were the case during the Desert Storm. So, so the trailing formation is the shooters, and now they're up two two v two against our lead uh, tiger one and tiger two, and from that point on, 
it's the two v two as I've talked about before. Mm-hmm. You know, the the, uh, the 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 sorting range, the final locks, turning hot, box you know bandit bandit box one in the air fox, or fox three, um, and, and so so those guys will go in uh, and, and finish the finish the kills with maybe the second element following suit because the worst position and this and this did happen in the fight i think it was rico again as a matter of fact in the fight against the two fulcrums yeah, um, he, 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 he split s the is this the one where he split s the second big 29 into the ground yeah 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 uh, so so in that particular fight <clears throat> the first two ship or the the other two ship wound up coming in in trail of the engaged two ship with the one that was initially chasing the fulcrums. And then the other two fulcrums popped up. Uh, and so, so that's the, that's the, I guess, beauty, if you will, uh, the, the art of air to combat, pushing the, um, pushing the, the, the draggers out of the fight with the radar and then turning hot in trail with your other element, the lead element, while those guys are are pursuing the the uh, the shooters, protecting their six o'clock from any other adversaries that pop up, hmm. and that's exactly what happened. Resulted in six kills that day, two fox bats, two fulcrums, and I think two. Yeah, I think two uh, make twenty threes. But anyway, my point is that it, it's kind of a ballet. It's an orchestra uh, uh, presented. Um, uh, opera, if you will, um, where only through good communications and excellent control by AWACS uh, to to uh, snap that that means an immediate vector to snap vector the uh, the the unengaged F-15s to join the fight and make sure that the the ones that are engaged are not overwhelmed in the fire in the fur ball uh, and, and get uh, get bounced by uh, uh, you know unseen unobserved bandits so that, that's and that's kind of how all that would flow <clears throat> and then finally from the visual arena and then as we talked about some time ago the next thing is to egress everybody heads south in this case there's a storm uh, everybody heads south and we'll find each other and then we'll find our own wingman if we're actually joined up on the member of the other element and we'll get sorted out and then we'll all pitch back, line abreast, wall of eagles, and take one last look at the at the aerial battlefield at the arena, and see if there's anybody trying to chase us out hmm. or chase the guys we're trying to protect. Uh, depending upon the fuel remaining and the ordnance remaining, we may can engage again. That's one of the beauties of the F-15, carrying four by four and a long range radar uh, and turbofan engines that don't burn a lot of gas. Uh, then that's that's the beauty of the F-15s. It, it it it's good for more than one engagement. Unlike, for instance, my dis- uh, description of what the Mirage F-1 mm-hmm. was limited to, which is an airplane of the same time frame. Okay, is that helpful? Very. Yeah. So lots lots of questions. So let me go back to one of the earlier things that you said then about how your four ship is basically two two ships two elements um operating sort of semi semi independently if the threat appears or um you know AWACS calls out hits whatever on the right side then it's the right side element that will take it and the left side element won't there was a mig kill maybe yes two. there was okay so the, so the question i was going to ask is how bad is the etiquette then if you are on the left side the the bandits called on the right side and you tell the element on the right to switch to come left and you then go after it. Is that, is that, that's uh that's actually a, a foul. It's a that's foul. bad form. Okay. But guess what? That doesn't show up in the history books. <laughs> Got mine. Find your own. There we go. Okay. There we go. So yeah, that happened. Yeah. Uh, it was a breach of uh discipline and it was, a, it was, uh, um, uh, but not the way that we were taught to do it, uh, but it happened anyway. Yeah. Okay. And then in that instance, the guy on the right side already had some mickles anyway. So, I mean, I suppose. So I had that going for him. Yeah, he did. <laughs>
And both of those guys, by the way, have been guests on this podcast. Oh. So, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Um, all right. They're great gonna, guys. They're both, they're both great guys. They are stand up. Yeah. You know, I, 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 come on. I can't fault them. No. You know, if, if I was leading the eight ship. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, can, I can see. Okay. Yeah. Let's switch. I, I got to decide that the bandits are on now. I don't care what we do. I can see that, that there's, yeah. there's, I won't say there's nothing wrong with it because it is a breach of discipline. It's a, it violates the briefing. Uh, so you know, discipline lasts as long as we follow what we were brief. Once we switch, then the whole the dynamics you have know, flip flops. So so the wingman you're putting the wingman a little bit uh, uh, all, you know off footed, if you will, to to now try to figure out what is Lee doing now. Where where do I go? Hmm. So, but it resulted in successful engagements, and so. I can't, you know, you, you can't argue with success, even if, even if you can criticize it. Yeah. And I don't, I don't mean to say, I don't, I don't mean to imply that anything that I've said is a criticism. It, it, it did happen. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, I should tell you, so Cluzo actually, because everyone, it's not difficult to figure out what engagement we're talking about, who we're talking about. So, but, but Cluzo saw, um, I think part one and he, he left the sweetest comment. He left this comment saying two of my favorite people in, in a room chatting. <laughs> um, in, in reference to me and you, so that was kind. So, clues if you listening to this, thanks. It is, yeah, he's a great um, guy. All right. So, second question then was going to be: um, when you go back to Desert Storm, it's it's a, it's a cool reference point uh, and uh, and a nice way of explaining some of this by uh, referencing real engagements. Um, but of course, on on night one, you know, JB Kelk ended up pushing ahead of the rest of his two sh- of his four ship because that they got those guys were on the tanker and the weather was bad and all this kind of stuff yeah they, you know th- things happen it never goes just like you planned it so, so that, it. That, that was gonna be my question then how often do you when you're when you're training do you th- sort of throw those kind of curveballs out there i mean would you as a training exercise send a send you know, the second element yeah. behind you or something like yeah. that. You, you'd always train with the perfect scenario. Well, I wouldn't say we train for the perfect scenario. We tra- we trained according to the, um, <laughs> that's the right word. We, we trained according to the, to the most favorable situation because you want to start by learning how to do it right then when things go wrong, you make tactical decisions to compensate for them. Mm. So, so when in training, you know, we have women that are right out of, right out of F-15 training. We, we may have someone coming back after being on a, on an S word tour of some sort. Uh, so, so no, we, we didn't uh, typically, um, you know, some flight leaders may have gotten about, uh, uh, a little creative and, and done that, but typically I'm not familiar with uh, any occasions where we uh, uh, we intentionally induced uh, our own hindrance, if you will, our own fog of war, or our own friction. Now, friction is the Clausewitzian word. There's I, I don't recall any times when we introduced our own friction into trying to do what we were training to achieve. Okay, so so let me ask a question on on, on that vein then. Um, and I know that you're talking you're talking to me as somebody who you know understands a fair bit, but I, but I'm not a peer of yours. I'm, I wasn't a fighter pilot. I haven't flown the F-15 um, operationally, and I don't really understand all the complexities. So maybe what you're doing is you're presenting a, a simplified picture of what you were doing. But it sounds to me like a lot of what you're talking about is quite straightforward. So so those rules of thumb, which is you know the wingman takes goes low, the, the, the flight lead takes the high airspace in terms of the radar search and, and those sorts of things, and then the sort follows the same principle or the same approach those sound simple to me there was somebody that you knew as well as i did a guy called um, obi-wan henderson um he was um he, f-105 guy in vietnam and and f-106 and then he came back and he was a red eagle commander flew flew the migs albert tonopar and then he spent the rest of his career working at nellis doing various things um, and one of them was the creation of tactics manuals for different air forces and he said to me a long time ago i mean he's he, he's passed now unfortunately but when i first met him 2006 i think it was he said to me 
as a fighter pilot, one of the things that he looks at in the tactics manuals is the complexity of the things that are expected of the young fighter pilot going into combat. The tactic, you know, a tactic is really, really complex. Someone else you and I both know, Hacker Haskin, a uh, Strike Eagle guy, said to me that some of the, the tactics were so complex in the Strike Eagle that he'd have to go into the vault and study those tactics the day before he was going to go and fly them the next day. So that sounds to me like there's a sort of, I don't, I don't want to say a disconnect, but there's a difference between what you're talking about and what those guys are talking about. So the question, I'm getting there, is um, were your tactics very, very complex? And what you're doing is you're presenting a simplified picture of those things. Or did you strive towards simplicity? Were you looking for the... Um, the most uh, natural tactic, the the most obvious tactic um, that everybody could remember, even under the pressure of combat, the strain of combat. Uh, and and did you look at tactics and think, okay, it's too complex, we need to simplify it? Or was it the other way around? You have to have complexity in order to deal with an advanced threat. Um, where's the balance and what was your experience? My experience was that the F-15, as a, um, as a fighting machine, uh, was so superior that we could keep the tactics simple um, and not get into whatever was so involved that uh, Obi Wan and uh, and Hacker are talking about. That, now, keep in mind, I think uh, things are a lot different in the air to ground community, uh, where the tactics have to deal with an air to air threat, a surface to air threat. Uh, you know, going in, uh, trying to get in, uh, unobserved if you can against an integrated air defense system, uh, working with other uh, agencies uh, in addition to AWACS. Um, <clears throat> whereas the, uh, the F-15, uh, I, I'd have to say, uh, I don't think our tactics were, were, uh, were, were very complicated or complex at all. Uh, you know, we were given the initial setup for the radar. Uh, the the search uh, volumes, as I described, the sort uh, requirements or sort uh, uh, responsibilities, as I've described, very simple, as you pointed out. Uh, the uh, the um, the the command decisions by the flight lead. You know, whether we're going to do a pincer, a bracket, or whether we're going to do a, a single side offset, uh, th those uh, are simple uh, because the F-15 was so superior that, that we could keep it simple, I would say, on, on the one end. But, but on the other hand, <clears throat> because of what, it, what was required to actually work the systems, to, to work the radar, to uh, integrate the RWR in your situation awareness, to, to listen to AWACS, um, you know, you know, give you give you clues and call the bandit and, and watching the range come down and, and having the whole engagement from 40 miles to to the merge be, you know, two to three minutes, a uh, thousand miles or 1200 miles of closure, miles per hour, not swift closure, <clears throat> because flying the airplane or working the airplane was actually so complicated. But simple in, in the way McDonnell Douglas set it up, ergonometry, it, it was very simple as far as uh, getting the weapons uh, cued and, and, uh, and in the air. Uh, so the, the tactics that allowed you to get to the range for you to employ those weapons uh, were, not, were not, they were very simple. They were easy to remember. You know, I, you know, I take my side on the radar look or low or whatever. Uh, I take I take the, if I'm the women, I take the trailer and the sword. Those are all briefed as just they're they're F-15 standard. Mm -hmm. uh, that was put out by the by the 422 F-15 standard. And and in a briefing, uh, that's the way it would be. The flight leader would give the time hack, you know, do the roll call on the lineup card, uh, and then you know start engines, taxi, takeoff would be briefed. Because sometimes that actually was the hardest part of the mission was getting out to the runway in order, <laughs> so that you could take off in order. But airborne, it was it was um, yeah sort F-15 standard, 
or I'm sorry, search F15 standard, sort F15 standard, uh, uh, the, yeah, the, the uh, intercept geometry F15 standard, meaning we're going to pull them to the nose at, at 10 miles. Uh, engage tactics. Okay. Uh, let's talk about how we're actually going to kill these guys. If we have to, if we wind up having to get into a, to a visual engagement uh, to do so. So, so, so my personal belief is that, that the, the F-15 tactics sound similar or sound simple because they were simple. They were easy to remember. Everybody knew their role. They knew their position and their role. The, the mission was always kill the bad guy. Uh, it had nothing to do with uh, geography, such as uh, an in, you know, ingress line of flight, you know, flight path, or an egress. It had nothing to do with SAMs. Uh, we would react defensively for the SAMs if they came up. But on an ingress of, such as I've just described, we're always relying on the weasels to, 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 sh to shut them up uh, for so we could do our job. Anyway, so, so it may seem deceptively simple, uh, but that's probably see because they were, uh, they were simple because the airplane was so intense to operate, uh, the sensors and the weapons and get missiles in the air and all of the calm associated with the calm is way, as you know, way more complicated than the actual flying tactics. Yeah. yeah. Can I, can I ask you about that? Uh, not the, not the, not the calm, but the sensor management then, um, and you know you you obviously are not going to answer if you don't want to answer. But I, I asked you the question about whether or not you guys were thinking about RCS as as time moved on. And of course, one of the things that was a big thing through you know the nineties, early two thousands in particular was the development of sensor fusion, the ability to pull all the data that the aeroplane is is able to to generate and maybe put it into one place so you're not having to look across the cockpit and at multiple things and build the the mental picture yourself w w did you have um any degree of sense of fusion in the eagle what can is that a, is that a topic you can talk about well i can because we didn't by the time i uh retired in 2000 um the uh, the f-15s that we were flying at eglin were were the oldest in the fleet. They were the same air, airplanes that I ferried across the Atlantic in 1981, you know, to to give the uh, the Tigers their first C models. So uh, so we're talking 20 years later. Yes, there's upgrades, tapes. We got an AMRAM. We got MISOF. We got you know we we got we've got significant enhancement of the airplane's capability. Uh, but uh, but. But that, that that was you know that's as far as I as I knew. Uh, that's that's what I walked walked away with. So, so the follow on question to that was going to be then around employing the aircraft in this four ship war or you know two 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 four ships to make an eight ship war whatever um, at night. You said something a couple of interviews back around it being a designed as a day the F fifteen being designed as a day interceptor. Uh, which made me think I never really asked you about you know how how you operate it at night and whether or not you then strip even more away from from whatever complexity there is in, in the way you're operating. Um, and of course, you're talking about pre night vision goggle time. You, I don't think you flew right. with logs. There was no helmet mounted sight, so you were flying in the dark. Um, how does then operating at night change the things that you've just described in terms of? Um, so one of the things you said an hour and a half ago was that you know if you were if you were flying as a two ship on a two ship wall you might be a mile or a mile and a half depending on atmospheric conditions which i guess means whether or not you can see the other guy now at night time with lights off presumably you, you presumably you're flying with lights off um you can't see you can't see the other guy so how does how does it work at night well and there's no reason to because you <laughs> the reason we fly line of breast is to check you know our formation mates six o'clock right if you can't see him you can't see his six o'clock so it's really it's really a waste of time to try to fly line breaths right so for night and this is before all those uh you know especially i mean even well even with night vision goggles we still did it this way up until 2000 when i left and and the way it was done was <clears throat> we would change the formation it's no longer a visual uh lookout that's needed to protect us from uh, an unobserved bandit coming to us. 
So <clears throat> we we would fly a a um, echelon formation, a pretty deep echelon formation, about a mile to two miles off to one side uh, of the flight leaders. Uh, and you're aware of the uh, the sensor, the AAI sensor, mm-hmm. uh, where with a with a push of the of a button on the throttles, we could interrogate anything out in front of us, even if there was no radar lock on. It would respond. It's a transponder interrogator, just like air traffic control has. You know, so it, so there's nothing magic or secret about it in that sense. <clears throat> so what we would do is is that let's say that we're in a defensive cap at night, just for instance. Then the flight lead would be out ahead of us. We'd be interrogating to make sure that we stayed at our prescribed range, a mile to two miles, and we typically would would put him about thirty left or thirty right. And at the end of the racetrack, he would go into his 180 turn, he, and he would call it. Uh, zero one's hot. Yeah, that's all it would take. You know, just a simple, or just just goes hot, meaning the flight leader is making starting the turn. And so, if we're a mile and a half or so behind, we'd you know count to ten potatoes, and then we'd go into a turn two hmm. as well, a turn as well. And then as we re- complete our 180, roll out, hit the the interrogation button. And find him again and position ourselves if the turn that slung us out wide or or made us you know deep in trail with him and we would have of course an altitude uh, differential lead would be at twenty thousand two would be at nineteen you know something like that and then and the, the purpose now is not defensive lookout but the purpose now is maximum firepower so we want to get with only a mile and a half back and at that 30 degrees is only really a mile. So our missile ranges are about the same, you know, plus or minus one. So we we both can still employ as a two ship as I've described, but it will be uh it'll be much more range uh oh, that's not right. I was gonna say range dependent, but that's not really really right. Lead lead has got the tactical lead. He he will do the offset if he calls uh uh you know, offsetting left or offsetting right or cranking left, cranking right. You push the interrogation button and, and just make sure you don't run into it. But but as the wingman, you prosecute your own attack. All the sorting remains the same. You know, uh, I'm the trailer if I'm the wingman. So I'll take the I'll take their trailer. If lead is targeted by their leader and he then he does a 180 uh, and pumps out of the out of the fight. Now the now the fight is on me. If they stay locked up with him, then I've got a clear shot. Uh, at whoever's going is trying to shoot him, uh, it's kind of a reverse uh, rope a dope or reverse uh, bag and drag. So anyway, that's how that's how we would just change the formation to uh, to 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 not worry about visual lookout, but maximize firepower. Can I ask one one more question then? And and sure. this is a slight change of of tack because it's not about four v four, but it is about the tail end of Desert Storm, and of course the well, it wasn't Desert Storm because it was nineteen ninety four, so it was three years afterwards. But the infamous shoot down of the two wow. Black Hawks. I'm putting you on the spot a little bit because I we haven't we don't do any we haven't really done any planning. And there's no been no been no discussion about what we it, it what doesn't we, matter we talk about. So, but I just wondered. Um, I think you know the story is well known. What happened is well known. So we, I, I wouldn't ask you to recount that unless there are some things that you want to say about it. But what I wanted to understand was what impact that had on the eagle community. And um, again, we talked two episodes ago, maybe one episode ago, about um, the culture, about the sort of the the ivory tower, sort of or, or being on the pedestal. You know, the the kings of you know the game of kings, the sport of kings. Um, and, and how that impacted your community and, and what, what you did about it and and whether it was something that, well, I don't want to say recovered from, that sounds very dramatic, but is it, but was it something that remained a stain on your reputation many years later or was it something that, that you were able to put behind you? Not personally, but as a community. I, I don't think, uh, I don't think, Steve, that I'm uh, able to answer that. Because I'm so much in the eagle community that seeing it from the outside is not possible. Um, I uh, so I so I you know I don't know uh, the uh, 
Oh, the 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 significance. Ah, eh, that's not the right word. I don't know the the gravity. I don't know the gravity of the uh, of the stain, if you will, um, uh, or the recovery uh, no, from it. But uh, but I, I will say this: there's two. There's basically two schools of thought, right? There are those who will support uh, uh, another a fellow F-15 pilot, fellow Eagle driver, even if he or she screwed up massively. Uh, uh, so there were a lot of supporters for th- those uh, those pilots uh, after that situation, following that situation. Um, uh, it is uh, uh, sadly, tragically, yeah. and uh, unfortunately, the only thing that I know of that the F-15 community ever did wrong. So you can probably just tell from that statement where I, I come down on the issue. Uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, it uh, it was a black mark. It was a it badly marred our otherwise pristine reputation. And I don't mean reputation as far as uh, being king of the hill in the F-15 or in the uh, air-to-air community within NATO or within the U.S. Air Force and all of the stuff that we talked about, about the culture that you've uh, alluded to. I don't mean that. I mean in terms of uh, performance, wartime employment of the airplane. What was it? 36 kills, no losses. You know, Uh, pristine performance by uh, the pilots flying that airplane in combat. Uh, doing what it was designed to do. And then we do this. Tragic, mm-hmm. tragic. Um, uh, the, and, you know, my heart goes out still to the families that, uh, that suffered loss in that terrible situation. Uh, so um, so it, uh, it, it uh, deeply disturbs me that we have that uh, that blemish if you will that then that's minimizing it to use that little word uh, that we have that that black mark on an otherwise pristine record of excellent performance in combat under fire and doing the job that that we were trained to do in the airplane that was designed to do it so so yeah that, now as far as how others felt about it other than the ones that that i just mentioned Eric at the outset uh, and and the, re, the quote recovery, uh, if that can, if that if that's possible, I can't tell you because I'm, I was on the inside, and and um, I was distressed enough about it, sure. to, uh, just myself. Uh, but I have no idea how others looking in from the outside not uh, judged us as a community. Did you did you so from the inside looking out? Then did you have did you notice a difference in the way people talked to you or engaged with you? Not personally, well, I suppose personally, but, but you know, as as a community. So when, um, you know, if you were tasked, you, you flew Northern Watch as a, you were the squadron commander at Schusterberg. Uh, you took your squadron, flew Northern Watch. I think that was before. Was that 93 you were in? Uh, at, at uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, we flew Northern Watch and the Tigers replaced us. The Tigers that did the shoot down, yeah. Uh, okay. The helicopter shoot down replaced us uh, there at Insulik. So you preceded no. it. So, so, so that was what I was curious about: whether or not people changed, whether they were tasking other people after that event um, instead of Eagles to fly Cap, or whether you know it was uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just no, just, no. That's fair enough. They, no, they, yeah, they they, bas- they basically came in, replaced us, and bef- and before we know it, we we learn of this tragedy. Uh, so, uh, when we got home to Schusterberg, of course, the first thing that, that we learned because it happened before this event, first thing we learned was that, uh, that, uh, the, the base had been slated for closure. Uh, the, the F-15s were going to be flown to, uh, to the, to Cape Cod, to the, uh, Otis Air National Guard, uh, unit, and that we were all being given reassignments. I wound up going off to, uh, Air War College, 
And there were a lot of discussions there at the Air War College about the situation. Uh, I do know that uh, the chief of staff of the Air Force did uh, the right thing and the way he handled uh, the, the situation uh, uh, after the lower echelons of command uh, failed to do so. And I was very proud of that, uh, that the... Uh, uh, but then, you know, I went from there to the Air Force Inspector General's team uh, and had rare opportunity to speak with anyone uh, uh, of any other tactical aviation discipline uh, in my job. Uh, when I went back to the Eagles at Eglin, um, I suppose the... Uh, the, the the initial pain or the hurt had worn off a little bit, uh, but it, it was, I won't say it, the subject was avoided, but it was never talked about either. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that was purposeful um, avoidance of the subject uh, or not. I don't, I don't have that sense that it was. It was like, okay, that's, that's in our history book. As sad as that is, and it is, uh, let's get on with the job. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... So I, I'm not sure I even answered your question with that uh, recounting my yeah my, you did my, uh, yeah you did as always it's the answer is the answer so I, I mean it, I I didn't you know I wasn't trying to um, oh I know you know sort of know. drag up uh, memories but I think it's you know it's it's everybody knows about it and it's an important thing and 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 people always talk about I say people always talk about people talk about what happened and they the the report details there's the air force published a report that detailed the AWACS failings the failings of the two f-15 pilots and across the board and so so people know technically what happened i suppose but what never really gets discussed is the outcome in terms of how the community right. recovered and how the community dealt with it because i think you know when you're you, if you're king of the hill and something as as you say tragic but also frankly amateur as that happens i mean just you know being unable to visually identify a Black Hawk helicopter as against a, a, a hind helicopter yeah. is, yeah, you know, it's just embarrassing. It just, oh, it is, you know, it, it is it, absolutely it, embarrassing. There are all these failings around the, the Black Hawks weren't squawking, the army hadn't told the Air Force the Black uh, Hawks were going to be there, but, you know, but that's all shit. I mean, that doesn't matter. It is, it, if you can't, it truly is, can't go and find it. And to even, even to blame AWAC smart mm. was a travesty, yeah, you know. Yeah. To, uh, Anyway, it's I, a, I wasn't. So I wasn't it, it, trying to drag it up. I was just curious. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's fine. I'm happy to talk about it, uh, it provided, you know, and uh, and this is a good context, but within the right context, you know, I can explain how it happened, uh, why, uh, what their motivation was that that, that uh, drove them to uh, uh, overreach, if you will, their own uh, responsibilities and ignore. Uh, the uh, safeguards that were established within that theater. I mean, I flew there for, for six months. I know how we were protecting the the um, the, the helicopters, the Blackhawks, and the C-130s that were going in, and the transols that were going in to, to help the Kurds. I know how that was, was supposed to work. Uh, but I also am aware of the, the, the factors that, that motivated the uh, um, the uh, the excursion, if you will, of, um, of you know, judgment, uh, of good judgment, and result in such an awful, awful tragedy. Like I say, it, to me, the bottom line is it is the only uh, black mark in an otherwise pristine history of the uh, the men and women flying the airplane and using it to do what it was designed to do. So, yeah. Well, uh, just kind of, I'm pretty. As much- you may as you may detect, I, I do have strong feelings about about uh, about it, but it's probably beyond the the uh, scope of this uh, podcast. Yeah, I th- I think in our book, didn't you? I think you wrote the ch- chapter on the shoot down. I think. I think you did. I'll have to go back and have a look at it again and see and see what we yeah. wrote about it. We as a collective. Yeah. What did we? About it. What did we say? What did we say? <laughs> Do you remember that time when I said to you, 
we were, we were having a chat a couple of years ago. I said, oh, man, this guy told me this great story the other day about an F-15 that um, a CIA agent did, uh, yeah, saw, yeah. saw at the airport in Somalia, <laughs> Mogadishu. <laughs> Have you ever heard about this story? And then and then <laughs> you, I think you phoned me back about an hour later and you read this passage to me and it explained the story beautifully. And I said, oh, that's it. Yeah. So where, where'd you read that? Where'd you read that? And you said, it's on page 147 of our book. <laughs> <laughs> so the the point That's being the point being i've forgotten i've forgotten what's in there uh i'll have to go back and have a look at it and see what it's hey um i am i am running out of time i am pretty much out of yeah time. Sure. It's, almost, it's almost midnight here and i better go to bed but um disco it's, it's wonderful talking to you and um i'm so grateful that you've come back again for the fifth time because we're out of time i said right at the beginning we're going to talk about campaign planning and talk about um to defeat the few your book that you wrote with the crackers um we're going to do that as a dedicated episode so we'll come back for a sixth time um we will do a dedicated discussion while well, you will tell me about campaigning planning and then you'll apply that to uh, how you and we'll discuss how you applied that to your battle of britain book and um we are then we've agreed separately we'll, we'll then do a live stream at some point probably next year where yeah. the, audi- the audience will have the opportunity to think about questions they want to ask you they can come to my discord channel and post some questions ahead or, or they can join us on the live stream and ask the questions live and that would also be an opportunity for people to talk to you about to defeat the few so we wouldn't limit that just to talking about the eagle we can talk about any any range of topics that you are um in a position to answer and, questions and on. see i can't tell you how much i'm looking forward to that because it'll give me another chance to apologize for my comments about the f-14 tomcat <laughs> and there we have it so that's uh that's the literary device known as ring composition where you start with the same thing you end with uh so thank you for that so that's it <laughs> disco thanks thanks for joining us again i'm really looking forward to pleasure as always part Steve. six um we'll speak to you soon <laughs> Cheers. Have a great weekend. Cheers, you too.